the making of a nation the beginnings of israel's history by charles foster kent this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the making of a nation the beginnings of israel's history by charles foster kent the invincible power of ambition and perseverance History and modern life abound in illustrations of what can be accomplished by the combination of ambition and perseverance. Cyrus, the king of a little upland province, through a remarkable series of victories became the undisputed master of southwestern Asia and laid the foundations of the great Persian Empire. Julius Caesar, who transformed Rome from a republic into an empire, and Napoleon the Corsican, are the classic illustrations of the power of great ambition and dauntless persistency. Far nobler is that trackless swamps and forests of Africa and blazed the way for the conquest of the dark continent. Equally significant is that noble ambition, coupled with heroic perseverance, that has enabled settlement workers to bring light to the darkest parts of our great cities. Ambition without persistency is but a dream or hope. Observe Jacob's persistency in the biblical stories. Does persistency, which has always been a marked characteristic of the Hebrew race, largely explain the achievements of the Jews throughout the world? Note the apparently scientific knowledge regarding breeding of lambs by Jacob in his dealings with Laban. Is it a fact recognized by science today? If he knew this and Laban did not, can you justify his acts? Can you justify the act of the director of a corporation who uses his prior knowledge of the business of his corporation to make profit from buying or selling its stocks? Who loses? Is he a trustee for their interests? What is the meaning of the strange story of Jacob's midnight struggle with the angel? Historical Bible 1, 119-20 What lessons did Jacob learn from this struggle? Would you call Jacob a truly religious man according to his light and training, or were his religious professions only hypocritical? May he have been sincere, but have had a wrong conception of religion? What is hypocrisy? Did Jacob's faith in Jehovah in the end prove the strongest force in his life? Is there any trace in his later years of the selfish ambition which earlier dominated him? What are his chief interests in the latter part of his life? Did he become the strong and noble character that he might have been had he from the first been guided by a worthy ambition? Were the misfortunes that came to him in his old age due largely to his own faults reappearing in the characters of his sons? 5. The Different Types of Ambition in the ultimate analysis, it is the man's motive which determines his character as well as his acts. As he thinketh within himself, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7 Man looketh on the outward appearance, but Jehovah on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 With many men, the strongest motive is the desire to surpass others. It not only leads them to perform certain acts, but in so doing shapes their habits, and character is largely the result of man's habitual way of acting. Jacob grew up narrow and crafty because of the selfish, dwarfing nature of his ambition. At first, his ambition was of a low type, that of the child which desires to acquire possessions and power simply for himself. In the child, this impulse is perfectly natural. In the normally developed individual, during the years of early adolescence, the years of 14 to 16, the social and altruistic impulses begin to develop and to take the place of those which are purely egoistic or selfish. When the fully developed man fails, as did Jacob, to leave behind childish things and retains the ambitions and impulses of the child, his condition is pitiable. Men of this type of ambition often achieve great things from the economic or political point of view. Economically, they are of greater value to society than the drifter. 
Sometimes, however, they bring ruin and disaster to society, as well as to themselves. Despots like Herod the Great and Napoleon, corrupt political bosses who play into the hands of certain classes at the expense of the general public, and men who employ grafting methods in business or politics, belong to this class. 6. The Development of Right Ambitions the desire to spare one's energies is natural to man. To gain wealth with the least expenditure of energy is said to be the chief economic motive. Most men are by nature lazy. This law of inertia applies not only in the physical world, but also in the intellectual, moral, and spiritual fields. The great majority of men follow the line of least resistance. In politics and morals, they accept the standards of their associates. Unconsciously, they join the great army of the drifters or followers who preserve the traditions of the past but contribute little to the future progress of the race. To deliver man from the control of his natural inertia, he must be touched by some strong, compelling power. Ambition is one great force that enables most men to overcome this inertia. The influences, therefore, which kindle ambition are among the most important which enter the life of man. In the Orient, the mother stands in especially close relation to the son. How far was Jacob's desire to surpass his brother inspired by his mother? Many of the world's greatest leaders trace the impulse which has led them to achieve directly to their parents and especially to their mothers. The mother of Charles and John Wesley is but one of the many mothers to whom the human race owes an inestimable debt. Of all the heritages which parents can leave their children, none is greater than a worthy ambition. Sometimes it is the personality of a great teacher which inspires the youthful ambition and directs it in lines of worthy achievement. How much of England's greatness may be traced to the quiet influence of Arnold of Rugby? Consider the unparalleled influence of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all primarily teachers. The true pastor with the spirit of a prophet is often able to guide those with whom he comes into intimate contact to great fields of service. In encouraging Sophia Smith, to found Smith College, that quiet New England pastor, the Reverend John M. Green, won a high place among those in America who first appreciated the importance of education of women. Equally great opportunities may lie before every pastor and teacher and citizen. Frequently, it is the contact through literature or in life with men or women who have done heroic deeds or have won success in the face of great obstacles that kindles the youthful ambition and stirs the latent motives which in turn develop strong and noble characters. Therein lies the perennial value of the biblical narratives. For many men, that which arouses their ambitions is the call of a great opportunity or responsibility. Note the change in General Grant's life with the outbreak of the Civil War. The unambitious Tanner becomes the untiring, rigid, unconquerable soldier. Striking illustrations of this fact are many men whose character, as well as conduct after they have been called to positions of political or judicial trust, is in marked contrast to their previous record. A corrupt lawyer has sometimes become an upright judge. The pride of office, the traditions of the bench, have sustained him. It is the privilege and duty of each man, by thoughtful deliberation and study, to shape and develop his own individual ambitions that they may conform to the highest ideals and thus guide him to the noblest and most worthy achievement. Of what value to a man is biography in forming his ambitions? Mention some biographies that you consider of the greatest help. In what ways are the life and teachings of Jesus of practical service in developing the ambitions of a man today? Questions for further consideration. Is it possible for a man without ambition to develop or to achieve anything really significant? 
In your judgment, what percentage of the men in your community really think out and carefully plan their lives? What proportion drift or take the way shown them by others? Some people consider mental or moral inertia the chief force that sustains the corrupt political boss. Is this true? What proportion of the voters in your voting district actually study and appreciate the issues in each election? What proportion of church members drift into their church membership? And what proportion join only after a careful study of the relative merits of the different churches? What are the chief ambitions that stir men to action? What was Jesus' ambition? Paul's, Florence Nightingale's, Abraham Lincoln's, Peter Cooper's, Garibaldi's, Dwight L. Moody's. Was there a common element in the ambition of each of these leaders of men? Is the realization of the ambition to serve one's fellow men limited to those who possess unique powers or opportunities? Subjects for further study. Number one, the law of inheritance among the early Semites. Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible 2, 470 through 473. Kent, Students, Old Testament 3. Johns, Babylonian and Assyrian Laws, Contracts and Letters, 161 through 167. Number 2. The Arameans, Hastings Dictionary of the Bible 1, 138 through 139. Encyclopedia of the Bible 1, 276 through 280. Peters, Early Hebrew Story, 45 through 47. 115 through 116, 133 through 134. Maspero, Struggle of the Nations, 126. Number three, the psychological connection between ambition, habits, character, and public life. Principles of Politics, Chapter 2 and 3, James, Talks to Teachers, Chapter 2. End of The Making of a Nation, The Beginnings of Israel's History by Charles Foster Kent Recording by Selena Arter